All right, you may be seated for the reading of God's Word today, because it's a little longer usual than reading, and I don't want to lose anyone along the way. How's that? Would you meet me in your Bibles at the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings, and we'll be reading chapter 5, verses 1 through 27. 2 Kings, chapter 5. Verses 1 through 27. Here's God's word. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten shekels of silver, six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothing and he brought the letter to the king of Israel which read when the letter when this letter reaches you know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant that you may cure him of his leprosy and when the king of Israel read the letter he tore his clothes and said am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends words to me to cure a man of his leprosy only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry, and he went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it's a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, for from now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He that is Elisha said to him, Go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman, the Syrian, is not accept- See, my master has spared this Naaman, the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say... There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on the two of the servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house, and he sent the men away, and they departed. He went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? 
Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. Now this is God's word for God's people, and thanks be to God for speaking to us today. Well, uh, it's hard to miss lately the traumatic events that have been taking place within the last several days overseas in the country of Afghanistan, hasn't it? From the comfort of our homes, we've seen images of devastation as the Taliban has invaded. We've heard the reports carrying the cries of help from the people there. And we've been praying for them individually, and we gathered together this past week to pray for them as a church. And I'm sure at some point along the way, most of us have wondered what it must be like to go from life as they knew it to a life they want nothing to do with. For me, I personally struggle most with imagining what it must be like for those who will find themselves displaced from their family and friends, maybe never to be reunited again. What must life be like for them? When stories are told about this heartbreaking event, at some point down the road, hopefully when the dust settles, if it ever will, what do you think would be the tone or the vibe of those stories? Wouldn't we be surprised to find in those stories feelings of compassion towards those who displaced them and maybe even hurt or killed their loved ones? As Christians, we know that Jesus tells us to pray for those who persecute us and to not overcome, to not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. But surely that has a limit in light of certain situations, or does it? God's word records a story for us here in 2 Kings chapter 5 that picks up with the life of a little girl who's found herself on the receiving end of a Taliban-like invasion that's left her displaced in a foreign country, away from family and friends, with no real hope of going back to life as she once knew it. And after the dust had settled and her new reality came into focus for her, the thoughtful and honest reader is surprised to find in her story feelings of compassion for the very ones who are to blame for the darkness she's found herself in. And before we unpack the spiritual realities that God's word holds out to us in this passage this morning, realities that are meant to enable his people to shine as his lights through dark and difficult times, I want to give a pastoral word to those of you who are currently living in or who have lived through your own dark situations of mistreatment or abuse. The story we read about today is one in which the little girl had no other options but to stay where she was. Those who were called to protect her were defeated. She had no choice, no way to go home, probably no home to return to. She had no government to help her or community to turn to. And so as we look at how she responded, the message today is not for those of you who may find yourself in oppressive situations to do the same and remain in your oppression. God's word is clear that he hates violence and that relationships are to be characterized by selflessness, love, and dignity. And that's why God has established governing authorities to act as his servant to punish wrongdoers. God has also called churches to protect the vulnerable and to put out those who are living contrary to the way of Christ. And while this is a very sensitive area, I want you to know that here at Five Points Community Church, we're serious about not only saying that there are ways for those in abusive situations, there are ways out but we're also ready to walk that difficult path with you in whatever way you need, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Sometimes freedom from oppression is in reach like it is for you today, and because it is, God's word says, get it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21. But in other situations, it's not, like was the case for this little girl of 2 Kings chapter 5. 
And so it's into this specific situation that I would like for us to turn and consider together this morning. What was it about this little girl that sustained her, that enabled her light to continue to shine? What was it that replaced feelings of resentment towards others with compassion for them and feelings of being rejected by God with trusting in him? Well, God's word holds out to us three spiritual realities here in our passage that enabled her and sustained her. And the first is the spiritual reality that people of God are people of faith. People of God are people of faith. And because when we sometimes talk about faith, it can sound kind of subjective and jello our text here helps us out by giving us two specific actions that accompany biblical faith. And the first is that faith sees beyond the darkness and trusts that God is still in control. Faith sees beyond the present darkness and trusts that God is still in control. Look again at verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that name and commander of the army of the king of Syria, he was a great man with his master, and he was in high favor. Why? Well, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Verse 2 tells us, Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Here we're made aware of both the present darkness, but also of the reality that God is still in control. The present darkness is that Syria had been victorious over Israel, and a recent raid had resulted in a little girl being kidnapped and forced into slavery. And who is the cause of this? Well, the victory of Syria over Israel is attributed, according to verse 1, to who? To God. And I say Syria's victory over Israel because for the past several years these two nations have been constantly at war. The book of 1 Kings ends with this reality, and 2 Kings picks right up from there. Look quickly back to 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings 22, just a couple pages back. Verse 31 tells us Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots. Fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. And now back to our passage where we see how a visit from a Syrian made the king of Israel feel. Again, verses 6 to 7. When this Syrian came with a letter from the king of Syria, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. How did the king of Israel respond in verse 7? Well, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Well, what is in the back of his mind about this visit? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Israel and Syria were constantly at war, and so it stands to reason that because God was the one who, attributed, who was attributed for Syria's victory over Israel, then he too can be attributed for the weakened Israel defense that opened them up for raids and the subsequent kidnap of this little girl. But the writer of 2 Kings isn't the only one acknowledging God's control in the face of darkness. Verse 3 tells us that this little girl still believed that God through his prophet could still do the impossible. Now, I don't know about you, but I've encountered far less difficulties in my life and responded to God's control with a stiff arm instead of a continued trust in him. And though our text doesn't explicitly tell us, we have reason to believe that things like complaining, pouting, and bitterness because of her situation did not characterize this little girl. And we can say that because our text tells us that, quote, she worked in the service of Naaman's wife, which could have meant all sorts of things, but the fact that she spoke to Naaman's wife set her apart in this ancient Near Eastern system of slavery as a loyal servant. She had the kind of trust about her that Joseph did when he was sold into slavery, a trust 
that didn't grow resentful or bitter towards God, but one that faced the present darkness and saw beyond it that God was still in control. Do you recall how Joseph described his trust at the end of the ordeal that he found himself in at the end of Genesis? When he talked to those who had wronged him, he said, you meant it for what? Evil, but God meant it for good. And it, was, and it was because this little girl had the same kind of faith that she gained a place of honor with Naaman's wife, which put into motion an opportunity for God to display his glory. I like the way one author helps us better understand the kind of trust that this little girl had in God when he said this, Trust in God does not guarantee that the tragic circumstances of life will never touch the Christian but it does promise a useful life and an ultimate hope, as her story shows. Trust in God does not guarantee that the tragic circumstances of life will never touch the Christian, but it does promise a useful life and an ultimate hope, as her story shows. Faith sees beyond the present darkness and still trusts that God is in control. But the second action that accompanies biblical faith is that it sees beyond the present darkness and it feels compassion towards those who wronged us. It sees beyond the present darkness and feels compassion towards those who wronged us. Look again at verse 3, where we see this played out. As the little girl says, Would that my Lord or with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I'm sure most of us here today know that the skin disease of leprosy brought with it a slow death sentence, not only physically, but socially as well. To be a leper meant that you were forced to live away from your community. No contact with home, no contact with work, no contact with your faith community. You lived out with other lepers. And while there were lots of different categories of leprosy, some not as severe as others, Naaman's was bad. And we know that because the word for cure that's used in reference to his condition throughout this chapter, it's the same word used for Miriam back in Numbers 14, if you recall that story, to describe her leprous condition and it means more than just healed. It means brought back. Brought back to life as you once knew it. Brought back home. Brought back to your community. So here's a little girl who's been forced away from life as she knew it. Cut off from family, friends, and her community. How easily it must have been for her to let her mind go there and to dwell in that darkness. And would we fault her? How easily it is for us to dwell in the ugliness of those who have wronged us and to then savor the moment when they get what's coming to them. Am I the only one who thinks that way? But not this little girl. Her faith saw beyond the darkness and it moved her with compassion towards the one who did her wrong. Compassion, like forgiveness, does not mean both the wronged and the one doing the wrong will be reconciled. Sometimes compassion simply means you pity the one who wronged you and you see them as a really needy person. Well, these two specific acts of faith by this little Israelite girl give us fresh meaning to Jesus' depiction of what genuine faith looks like when he described it as, do you remember? Faith as what? A child. Faith as a child. People of God are people of faith. It's a faith that sees beyond the present darkness and simply trusts that God is still in control and it's a faith that sees beyond the present darkness and feels compassion towards those who wrong us. 
But the second spiritual reality that will sustain us in darkness and enable us to shine is remembering that only God can help the hopeless, but his help cannot be bought. The second spiritual reality that will sustain us in darkness and enable us to shine is remembering that only God can help the hopeless, but his help cannot be bought. The hopeless condition of Naaman is highlighted by the fact that he's willing to go on the word of a little girl. He's also willing to pay a huge amount of money and his desperation is the kind that gets the attention of two separate kings. But it's the king of Israel who puts the final touches on how desperate Naaman's situation was when he says in response to the letter of request sent by the king of Syria there in verse 7, look there again. He responds to the urgency of the letter with this, Am I God? to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? And he's right, isn't he? Only God could help Naaman. But our story wants us to know that God's help cannot be bought. And that's why God's spokesman, Elisha, didn't even bother to look at the amount of silver and gold and all the designer clothes that Naaman brought with him. Did you notice that? He didn't even come out to look. And he didn't come out to look because it did not matter. I uh, thought about calculating how much all that gold and silver was, but I'm not a math guy, so I quickly gave up. But I think just the gold was close to a few hundred thousand dollars. That's obviously not to mention the silver and all the other clothing. But again, it didn't matter because who owns all of that already? God does. God owns the world. He is in need of nothing. And in fact, to drive the point home to Naaman, Elisha told him instead to not only empty his pockets before the Lord, but to also empty his heart of his pride as well and to demonstrate that by washing in the Jordan River, a river that didn't compare with the beautiful rivers of Naaman's hometown. And how did Naaman respond to this message? Verses 11 and 12 again. Tell us, but Naaman was angry, and he went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Well, thankfully for Naaman, his servants talked some sense into him, and he finally emptied his pockets of his money and his heart of pride, and he did what God's spokesman told him to do. And when he did, he discovered the grace of God that not only transformed his diseased skin into healthy skin, but also he discovered the grace of God that transformed his entire life. Just like the little girl represents the spiritual childlike faith of all who come to follow Jesus, Naaman's physical condition represents the spiritual condition of all humanity. As one theologian put it, Naaman's condition of leprosy was a, quote, spoiling, spreading, separating condition. And unless God intervened, there would be no hope. Leprosy didn't care who Naaman was. It didn't care how important he was or how much money he had, and neither does sin. It infects us all. And no amount of money or any earthly good can do anything to heal it. But thankfully, like Naaman, a way has been provided through the sheer grace of God. And that comes, that way comes through the washing of the shed blood of Jesus, his sacrificial death to pay the penalty our sins deserve. The question is, are we, are you 
willing to empty your hands of trying to buy what only Jesus came to do? Are you willing to empty your pride and accept the word of God even though it looks and sounds like foolishness compared with worldly wisdom? The grace of God that comes to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus not only heals us of the disease of sin, but it also transforms us into brand new people. Did you notice in our story how Naaman went from being a big, prideful, mighty man to being compared to a little child there in verse 14? Look there again with me. So he, Naaman, went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. The words little child there are the same words used to describe the little girl in verse 2. But did you notice, too, how Naaman went from the commander of the army of the king of Syria to referring to himself as servant? He does that five times between verses 15 and 19. And it was the faith of his little servant girl who believed enough to tell him that only God can help the hopeless. And friends, that's a great word of reminder to those of us who struggle to find the courage, who struggle to find the courage to share the hope of the gospel with others. May God help us to truly believe that only he can help the hopeless, and may we take our opportunities to put into motion ways for God to display his glory. Well, before we come to our third and final point today, I want us to quickly consider that interesting request that Naaman made there in verses 17 to 19 for pardon. I wonder if that has ever stuck out to you before, or maybe this morning if it did. After he was healed, he has this interesting request for pardon. Verse 17 says, Then Naaman said to Elisha, If not, if you won't take this, then please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of dirt of earth, for from now on your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. Here it is. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. Elisha said to him, go in peace. Elisha's response to Naaman's request for pardon of go in peace is such a great example for those of us who have been Christians for a while, trying to help younger believers out with their sensitive consciences and fresh desire to serve the Lord. If those of us who are farther along in the faith aren't careful, we can point our younger brothers and sisters down the path of law with a list of do's and don'ts the Bible says nothing about. So instead, let's follow the Example the Elisha gives us here and point them down the path of grace. <clears throat> For it is, after all, God's grace that does what in us? It saves us, it trains us, and it brings us safely home. And so that brings us to our third and final spiritual reality that enabled this little girl to shine in such a dark situation. And that third reality is that God's sovereign grace, or in other words, God's choice to save who he will, is to be praised and not despised. God's sovereign grace to save those he will is to be praised and not despised. And when it came to the little girl, was there even the slightest hint that she despised the thought of God's grace healing her master? Not even a hint. But there is another servant in our story today who stands in stark contrast to her, and we bump into him following Naaman's healing there, beginning at the second part of 19b, where we read this. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman the Syrian. 
in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he that is Gehazi said, All is well. My master has sent me to say, There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up the two talents of silver in two bags and two changes of clothing and laid them on the two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house, and he sent the men away, and they departed. Unlike Naaman's servant, Elisha's wanted him to pay for the free grace of God. No doubt he thought the Syrian didn't deserve it. And even after two emphatic statements made by his master that God's grace cannot be bought so that God and God alone gets the glory, Gehazi just couldn't let it go. And because he insisted on spoiling the beauty of salvation by grace alone, God spoiled his selfish plans by transferring Naaman's leprosy onto him. And so Gehazi stands to re remind us of how seriously God takes it when we despise his sovereign grace instead of praising it and passing it on to others who are just as needy as us. So three spiritual realities today meant to sustain God's people, meant to cause us to continue to shine in the face of great darkness. And I wonder as we briefly meditated on those three spiritual realities today, those realities that did cause a light to shine in the darkest of times. I wonder if you feel like you just don't have what it takes to respond like this little Israelite girl. Do you feel like you barely have enough grace or enough faith to scrape together just enough to trust God with your day-to-day -day difficulties of wondering where the money's going to come from for that unexpected bill? Or enough faith to scrape together just enough trust to provide a way of escape from that same temptation you gave into again last night? Do you feel like you believe that God's grace is, that God's grace alone, that it is that that saves, but you still fight the temptation to perform your way into his favor or to enforce that performance mindset onto others? You find it easy to sing about God's saving grace to you, but struggle thinking about that grace going to those who have wronged you. Well, if you do, that's okay, because the good news today is that the little girl of 2 Kings 5 is not meant to cause us to look within ourselves and try even harder. The little girl of 2 Kings 5 is meant to cause us to look outside of ourselves to another little, seemingly insignificant child, one who would one day come to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. A child who would enter into our darkness, who would grow up to be rejected by his own, horribly mistreated, but instead of feeling resentment, he'd be moved with compassion. Instead of rejecting his father's will, he trusts him completely. And instead of despising God's gracious way of salvation, he joyfully secure it. And because of him, because of Jesus, and his life, death, and resurrection, all who trust in him are granted not only the healing our sinful hearts so desperately need, but also the promised presence of his spirit who equips us and enables us to be the lights in the darkness he's called us to be. So in closing, to those here today who, like Naaman, have tried with no success to care for the soiled, spreading, separating condition in them the Bible calls sin, won't you, like mighty Naaman, stop your striving 
and become like a little child by resting in the finished work of Jesus. This one who went to the cross in order to exchange his perfect life for your life of sin and to pay the price you owed so that your death sentence would pass from you onto him. Won't you come to Jesus today? And to those of us who, by God's grace alone, have experienced the cleansing of our sin and the indwelling of God's Spirit, what a welcomed light we've become in the midst of a dark and needy world. May we remember this week that the grace of God that saved us is the grace of God that's at work in us, transforming us more and more into little, seemingly insignificant servants, but used in significant ways by our loving master to bring hope into hopeless situations, and it's all to the praise of his great name. Let's pray. So, Lord, we confess that we don't have what it takes in ourselves to pray for our enemies and to not overcome evil with evil, but rather with good. We confess that the darkness of our world sometimes causes us to doubt you and to look past the needy people around us. Lord, we confess that we are too quick to forget that your grace towards us is 100% undeserved. And so today, Lord, we're thankful for your living word, reminding us once again that your grace to us in Jesus will enable us to be who you've called us to be, no matter the darkness around us. And so may your spirit impart in us fresh Jesus-like trust and Jesus-like compassion for others and Jesus-like longing to see your sovereign grace experienced by our neighbors in the nations. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.